hello, everybody, and welcome to this fourth and uh, final session of our Open Access 101 series. Uh, I'm Nick Shockey, Sparks Director of Programs uh, and Engagement, and thrilled to welcome everybody to the session uh, this afternoon. This series, again, as a refresher, is meant to provide an entry point into open access related work and libraries uh, for those who may be new to it uh, or serve as a refresher for those who are already doing uh, this work. And as with our earlier sessions, there will be a really short uh, pop up survey that will open when this session ends. And we would really appreciate your feedback, uh, both on today's event and uh, you know, related to sort of this series as a whole. Um, as we're reaching the endpoint of at least sort of this pilot phase uh, of, of this series. Uh, so as we uh, start the session similar to past ones, uh, I'll again invite folks to introduce yourself briefly in the chat uh, by sharing uh, your name and institution. Uh, and if you came into the session with any burning questions, uh, you are welcome to go ahead and ask those through the Q&A panel. Uh, as well. We've uh, sort of collated the questions that we got in advance um, and sort of uh, Will, Marie, and Josh have translated those into a series of slides, but we'll also have plenty of time for Q&A after the sort of prepared answers um, that Josh, Marie, and Will will, will provide. Again, uh, with Open Access Week coming up uh, in just a few short weeks at the end of October, uh, we wanted to add today's session to our initial slate of three Open Access 101 uh, events to help folks prepare for the conversations uh, and, uh, and questions that inevitably come uh, as, part of, um, as part of Open Access Week. We have uh, scheduled this session for 90 minutes to allow for an extended Q&A. If there are you know, lots and lots of questions that folks want to get to, we don't necessarily need to use all of that time, but wanted to schedule uh, that in case the discussion runs that long. But if you need to run at the top of the hour, uh, you know, please uh, don't worry about that. Totally understand. And this session's being recorded and will be emailed out to everyone registered for uh, the event today and will also be made publicly available online. Again, please don't be shy about sharing your own experiences related to these questions or any thoughts that you have uh, in the, the chat throughout today's session. Uh, again, for questions specifically, we'd ask uh, that you use the Q&A functionality in Zoom, um, which will just help us uh, to sort of keep those separate so we don't miss any uh, in the chat. You can also upvote or even respond to other questions that, that folks ask so you can participate that way uh, as well. And uh, lastly, I just want to reiterate how wonderful it's been to collaborate with uh, uh, Maria, Josh, and Will on this series. We're really thankful for their partnership in organizing this uh, you know, series of Open Access 101 events and all of the work on their end that's gone into it. Um, and for anyone that hasn't attended an earlier session, be sure to, uh, to check out their uh, Open Access book, Scholarly Communication, Librarianship, and Open Knowledge. Um, a link to which I am going to paste in the chat uh, now, but the, the book's a great um, series of, or provides a great series of case studies about open related work in libraries written by the folks doing that work uh, that again, I think is a really rich resource for um, you know anybody with an interest in joining today's call. And so uh, with that intro out of the way, I will go ahead and turn it over to Will, who I believe is gonna kick us off today. That's right. Thank you, Nick, for that kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. It's This feels like overtime or some some sort of bonus time. And so I'm really we're really flattered to see folks here uh, interested to come back for more. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share screen now. So let's see if I can talk and chew gum at the same time, which is always a dubious proposition um, to share some slides. The purpose of today's session is to sort of take the high level conversations we've been having and turn that into something really actionable in terms of the questions that you are likely to get when you're talking to colleagues, to scholars outside of the library and to other folks as well. Um, and this is a timely session because with Open Access Week, only a few weeks away, uh, we sort of expect a, sort of a rise in questions of different folks coming and saying, hey, what about this? Or I, I heard about that. Or can you tell me more about this sort of thing? So the framing for today's event is we're going to do just, just a quick reminder about the foundation. So we have that shared language. And then we have pulled a set of questions from that book that um, Nick mentioned 
This is a set of um, our colleague Amy Buckland, who wrote the open access section of the book, talks about these as common OA myths. Um, we're not sure if these are necessarily myths or just sort of questions that often need some interrogation or some digging into, but we've, we've used that set of questions and then we're going to sort of go round robin Maria, myself, and, and Josh hopefully as well to talk through the way we often respond when that question comes to us. We'll then hand it off to maybe another person here, so I, I might say here's how I respond to that, and then Maria will say oh I, I take a different tack, I talk about it this way a little bit as well. Um, and then we really want to invite you all in the chat to, to share how you respond when you hear that question, if it's a question you've heard in the past, um, and also to share some questions. And I think if, if we do a good job here, we're going to leave some time for you to raise other uh, either common questions that you feel like you have a strong answer to or questions that you've gotten that you don't feel like you have a strong answer to. And maybe we can bat those around a little bit as well. Um, Maria, feel free to raise those it, as we're talking, since you can see the chat, and I cannot at this moment while I'm running the slides. Um, yeah, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Maria. Um, so briefly, faces you're sick of seeing at this point, um, Maria, myself, and Josh have been excited to lead this project. Um, we are different in that we come from different types of institutions in different regions of the country. We are the same in that we're all at sort of big R1s. Um, so we, we present our perspective as three sort of points that are somewhat different, but we recognize that there, those similarities give us spots that that um, limit our ability to fully perceive what's happening. So we really value folks in the chat and otherwise uh, filling in those gaps and helping give us a fuller picture of, of the way to think about these issues. Um, if you want to go back and, and review those amazing previous sessions, or if you missed any of those sessions, we also wanted to share the fact that all of the session recordings are available at this link here. Maybe we can drop that in chat as well, um, just so you have that at your fingertips. Uh, so very briefly, just a, a fundamentals of OA review open access is this idea of scholarly literature that's digital, online, free, in the different senses of the term free. Um, it's generally done through either the gold or the green road, publishing openly or using a repository to make OA available in different spaces. Um, authors come into open access for a lot of different reasons, and I suspect you're going to see each of these bullets represented at some point in our myths and questions. So keep an eye out for, I'm enthusiastic about this because, or, ugh, I have to do this and I hate it because this and this and this as well. Um, and often those questions come come from these set of concerns that we've shared in the past. We're going to address some of these in the in the copyright common questions, and we can raise some others in chat as well. Um, and then probably the most important thing to say about this is when you're having this this conversational opportunity, when you're doing an event or when you're walking down the hall and somebody walks up and asks a question, whether it's a this OA sounds awesome, tell me more about it, or a I can't believe they're making me do this. This is your fault, isn't it? Whatever the tenor of the question, um, start from your context, think about the opportunities and pain points uh, and where the other person is coming from, and especially this last one down here at the bottom, be real. The North Star for open access advocacy and work is genuinely meeting people where they are, not trying to BS somebody about how this is great when it's really not, not uh, diminishing or minimizing people's legitimate concerns about changing the way that they do the core work of their, their career and their life in a lot of ways. Um, so that, that emphasis on being real, I hope you'll hear as a theme throughout the conversations here. This is a nice opportunity to pass the baton over to you, Josh, and, and talk about how you respond when somebody asks you the question, open access publications aren't peer reviewed. That's a problem, right? How do you how do you respond to that sort of comment or question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Will. And thanks, everybody. I'm sorry, sorry if my uh, technical problems was or a challenge, but uh, it's, it seems like you all ably leaped ahead. Um, so um, so I mean, one thing that I would point out when I get questions like this that can take a variety of forms uh, is that at this point, every major publisher is the publisher of a portfolio of open access journals, and often they are bragging about the size of their portfolio of open access journals. And in that case, where a publisher is a publisher of both subscription and open model journals, they frequently have the exact same peer review model, the exact same policies, workflows, and even reviewers um, in their open journals as with their subscription journals. Um, there's literally no difference in the peer review in those in those situations. Um, there are, of course, you know, bad actors, those who misrepresent 
uh, peer review claiming that it is done when it is actually not done or when there's some like extremely cursory version of it done while professing to uphold a, a, a better practice. Um, but that's a legitimacy problem. And uh, if we can rule that out, it's simply false to claim that open access publications are not peer reviewed. Um, I think you could also attack this in a sense of like um, problematizing our understanding of peer review. Um, sort of to imagine that peer review is free of bias um, or effective in any way that's appropriate, uh, pro uh, approaching comprehend comprehensive is not reflective of reality. So like if you go to a site like Retraction Watch, you can see the frequency with which um, journals, including the most name brand journals and publishers, uh, that peer review process is failing. Um, so concerns about peer review can be expressed in questions about predatory publishing and legitimacy um, or on the quality of peer review. And I would keep in mind that the goal of open access isn't to encourage researchers to place their work in inferior venues, it's to help them find the widest readership and impact and support them making their own informed decisions. Um, so open access can be achieved through archiving in the vast majority of subscription journals where those trusted peer review processes uh, are in place. Um, that happens after peer review is complete generally. And so shareable manuscripts um, usually are the accepted manuscript, including all the changes associated with the peer review process. Um, if we're talking about open journals, I would use a tool like Think, Check, Submit to evaluate the legitimacy of those journals. Um, they have a checklist there uh, with a section on peer review and on publisher engagement in industry organizations like uh, the uh, Co Committee on Publication Ethics, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, and all of those have criteria um, and standards about expected behavior uh, and policy. And so once you can establish legitimacy, um, I'd look at that peer review policy and talk with the, the researcher who's asking about it. Um, talk about some of the flawed assumptions that relate to peer review. Um, it might just be that the peer review po policy is unfamiliar. It might be one like PLOS One focuses on rigor rather than novelty, and that might be unfamiliar to the researcher. Um, so we, I would look at that um, and then dig into whatever the publisher says about their peer review policy and maybe look at the other scholars um, and authors who have published in that journal um, or who are editors on that journal to sort of assess like, is this as risky as you assumed that it may be? Um, and then finally, if the um, if the concern is, is about the presence of an article processing charge and the uh, sort of like, is this vanity publishing? Um, I would again, check the legitimacy of the of the journal like with Think, Check, Submit, um, and then talk frankly with the, the researcher about article processing charge models, the sort of what, who, how, and why of them, including critiques of them. Um, and I might also problematize vanity. So like um, we, we talk about vanity in the terms of predatory, like pay to publish, but, uh, but also I think we could talk about the most elite uh, high impact journals as vanity targets, um, albeit in a, in a different sense than the other. And, um, I don't know how much this was set up, but we're hoping for audience participation in the chat or uh, my co-panelists if they have anything to add. I'd only uh, add, this is Maria here, that uh, one thing you might in an extended conversation point out that particularly in the early days of developing open access journals, the people behind them were often uh, reform minded or looking to improve the scholarly publishing system. And therefore they were also open to alternative models of peer review than the sort of traditional single or double blind, what's going on behind the curtain, we're not sure models. So some of those open access journals did experiment and are continuing to experiment with open review, citizen review, post-publication review. And the, really what you have to do is look at the journal. This is what Josh was saying and see what they say about their peer review processes and, and policies uh, and, and how they um, validate and assign credentials to, to the articles that they accept. Will, anything? Um, this is really 
really good. And I, I think we might have some good comments in chat as well, but I, I wanna thank you, Josh and Maria for that great sort of in-depth discussion there. Um, I think we're gonna get to some of the issues, particularly around the sort of the valuing and validating stuff as we move into our next question. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about the, the money and turn to our economic expert, Maria. Um, how do you, when, when somebody asks you the sure question? I'm not say that if you look at my household budget, but I, so, so I am, uh, some of you know me, uh, I am a faculty member at the School of Information Sciences at Illinois. And so I'm in the classroom a lot and I'll say to you what, my students here ad nauseum, maybe, or it's complicated. Does open access mean that the author must pay? Well, I guess we can simply say always must pay. No, doesn't mean that. Um, I think if you enter into conversation with faculty, it's both realistic and an educational opportunity for them to point out that publishing does involve labor. Um, and the kind of publishing that's become, if you'll excuse the economic metaphor, the coin of the realm in the academy, the sort of polished, uh, carefully edited, well laid out um, publishing uh, that causes, involves more labor, a considerable amount of labor, and it's the socio in our socio economic context. We'll sit always pay attention to context. We expect that labor will be compensated. So the simple way of saying this is publishing costs money. So wh where's the money going to come from? Uh, and the model that seems to be both most commonly used and commonly understood is, well, if the libraries aren't going to pay for it or individuals aren't going to buy it because it's open, maybe authors will pay, pay us to do that work. And there's a large number of journals that, that, that work on that model, uh, particularly the ones by profit-driven uh, publishers. But it's important to understand that not all of them do. Uh, there are other ways. There's a lot of conversation these days about diamond open access, which is generally um, access that's supported by um, institutions and organizations as part of their mission, as part of what they spend their money on, and they may not choose to uh, charge authors. Uh, there is are many people um, who are in, in anticipation that they may need or want to cover an, um, an article payment charge, uh, write that into their funding requests. And that can be something that you can work with faculty on. So have you thought about it? It's also a, a good opportunity to provide some education about the range of APCs or other publication fees, which can go from very small to thousands and thousands of dollars in high prestige, privately published, um, journals, particularly in the STEM fields. Uh, so it's worth having them look at, well, what is the APC? And having some conversation about what a reasonable APC might be. And I'll, I'll say lastly, just to illustrate the range, uh, I helped start many years ago a, what is now a very high prestige journal in philosophy. Uh, sure, it costs money to produce it, but it's run almost entirely still on volunteer labor. Uh, by the original editors and those that they recruited. But uh, and I, in helping them, I said, I can do a lot from the library in helping you to get this online. Uh, somebody's got to pay the copy editor. And they went, okay, well, let's see. An article mm, takes about an hour. At the time, this was in Michigan, and probably around 2000, minimum wage was, gosh, 14, I think. And they said, well, $25 that should pay a, a, a talented uh, doctoral student uh, for enough time to review an article and uh, and just make sure that it's properly copy edited and the timing, that did, timing did work out pretty well. And I went and checked on them in preparation for the stock. They're still charging $25. Uh, they just wanna make sure that that copy editor gets paid. Um, their, their grad students may say they're, they're worth more now, but it's still more than minimum wage for an hour. Um, so, and they get a lot of credit associated with that too. Uh, so that, but so there is a range and there are many places that you can look and sometimes institutions, research offices, libraries have some funding to help authors pay. So you don't always have to pay, but if you do, it may not be a matter of reaching into your own pocket. If it is a matter of reaching into your own pocket, think about what the charge is and 
and whether that's a good value for you. Josh, Will, or so I, I see things have been busy in the chat. I'll look at those too. Well, I just want to plus one, Maria. I think a really important thing you said is that th there is labor here. And so finding a way to recognize and compensate it is, is important. This goes back to the be real comment from a moment ago. Um, but that because there are different models, I, a statistic I used to cite that, that Josh, you may be more up on this than I am, is that the Directory of Open Access Journals suggests that more than half, so the majority of open venues do not have APCs attached to them. I think that's still the case, but but things may have changed. Yeah, I think it's around 65%. So like I, what I believe is accurate to say is that a majority of open journals don't charge article processing charges. A majority of openly published articles are funded by article processing charges. And that's like skewing effect of mega journals um that's sort of driving that but um those statements are simultaneously correct yes absolutely. and they should also have mentioned transformative agreements as something mm -hmm. that's getting a lot of discussion these days where somebody is paying an article processing charge but it's not not the author uh, that's through an arrangement with the library so if the question is does that mean i the author has to pay the answer will be maybe Yes. And it goes to the sort of the credibility point that both of these, the questions on the question before got to is like, if this question is a dressed up version of, is this a scam? Is this just vanity stuff? There's a good answer that like, no, there needs to be money here because there is expertise and there is value happening, but this isn't coming out of your pocket necessarily. Um, I also, at my institution, we talk about green open access. We talk about preprints. We use open access as an opportunity to talk about new ways to connect with audiences uh, that are that are at different stages of the process or or that open up new opportunities in different spaces. So there's the very good answer Maria gave about why there needs to be some money somewhere in the system and the different spaces that come from. Um, and then I would add to that the the let's talk about what you want out of a publication. If, if you want to be in the most high impact, impressive journal, this is what that looks like. If you just want to get your stuff out there so people can read it, we've got a repository, we've got, you know, this great preprint server, etc. as well. Josh, did you want to add on to that? Um, I think the only thing that I would add is that, like, yeah, leaning into the opportunity to share more information and educate about, like, you know, even where there is a transformative agreement in place, and uh, at my institution, we have access to a number of them, also educating them about some of the challenges of those agreements and inequity related to them, and, you know, the, the reality of the broader context of them, not just like, yay, you're good to go, but uh, your fee may be wavered. And let's talk for a minute about how these agreements work and what's uh, what's maybe not ideal about them um, and try to sort of like bring them into some of those conversations. Absolutely. The, the, the making visible, the invisible, either the cost libraries were paying 25 years ago or the often dismissed wrongly cost that like, well, it's just putting a, you know, a web page up. That's basically free, right? Um, no, neither of those things are true. Making those visible is really, really important. Um, the next question I think is mine, and this is one of my favorite questions to get as the lawyer in the libraries. The question is, open access means giving up my copyright. I have this thing and you mean old OA people are trying to steal my property from me. Um, this is, of course, an ironic concern since the old closed access model was built explicitly on copyright assignment, or maybe even more often the fiction of work made for hire, right? So, so the old model that open access is a response to was very much about asking you to give up your copyright. Um, so, the, so the fact that OA is grounded in the concept of author's rights, which is about returning agency, agency to the author to either retain their copyright or use it in ways that align more with their values, um, that I think is one of the great selling points of open access in a lot of ways. And so helping people understand what a Creative Commons license means, for example, to say this is a some rights reserved li license where you you remain the copyright holder, but you are allowing the sort of uses that are beneficial to you. The more eyeballs leads to more readership, leads to more citation stuff. Um, so in fact, this is a this is a model that gives you much more control over your copyright copyright at a much more granular level as well. Um, so I generally say that a scholar who asks about their copyright is already primed 
um, for one of the core practices of open access and can benefit from sitting down to do the stuff that is my bread and butter in a lot of ways. A contract review, here's what this says, here what this clause means, etc. And then looking at resources from places like Sherpa Romeo that can help you understand what publishers of all stripes require from you in different ways. The other thing I wanted to say about this piece is sometimes when authors come in talking about copyright, what they actually have in their eyes are royalties. They have like dollar signs. And when they say, I don't want to give away copyright, what they really mean is, I'm going to get rich off this and I don't want to give away this golden ticket I have. Um, this is maybe sometimes true with journals. It happens a lot more often when you're talking about monographs and textbooks and those other things that exist in sometimes different economic spaces. Um, and, and in fact, at some level, the, the perceived or expected bargain in copyright law is the author trades their copyright for the money that they need to keep going. Um, so that's not, you know, necessarily a, a completely illogical conflation between copyright and royalties, although as Maria closest to the press world can tell you might be an overstated expectation of royalties in some <laughs> cases. Um, Josh, you said it exactly, I, Josh or Maria, one of you used the term coin of the realm, and of course a lot of faculty immediately know like, no, this journal article probably isn't going to make me a million dollars, but it can give me the reputation I need to move on in my career, to get my next grant, to do the public serving stuff, etc. So, so there is a way to talk about copyright and royalties in terms of economic advancement that is, you know, open access superchargers rather than gets in the way of in some sense. And then there are often some cases where I really do have to sit down and have a, a delicate and kind and gentle conversation about what a realistic expectation of royalties must be. This is a wonderful monograph. You've put your heart and soul into it. Um, it's going to sell about 25 copies. <laughs> and sometimes I can have that conversation, sometimes another subject expert in the library. This is our expert in philosophy. They can really talk about it. They buy the philosophy book, so let them tell you what that looks like. And we're really lucky to have a friendly local university press as well, who can speak at, at great depth about what is actually happening with royalties. Sometimes that is a, a very kind, no, in fact, we're going to spend more printing this book than you are going to, or anybody is going to see back from royalties. But sometimes it's a more thoughtful creation of new models, right? So, so there's one model we can all recommend firsthand is releasing an open access digital version for free and openly, and then selling the print copy to recover costs. That's what we've done with the book that you see in the lower right hand of the screen here. And I think it's worked out pretty well for us. So sometimes it's a way of saying you can retain your copyright and make it openly available. And there's a way to address the costs in different ways by focusing on print or other models like that. So that, that's my sort of quick overview of the, the copyright question that comes up sometimes. Maria or Josh, do you want to add some gloss to that or, or correct anything I messed up? It's I, I, It would be unlikely that I would ever be able to correct you on a copyright thing. Uh, <laughs> but um, it not a, it's not, an op, I haven't seen it with open access um, because this doesn't tend to occur with open access contracts. But occasionally I've interacted with uh, authors, usually in the humanities, usually around books or book chapters, where they'll have had a conversation with me and then they might follow up on their next contract and they, they'll say it's think, things like, uh, hey, I did it. I, like, I, I kept my copyright. But when we looked at the finer language, um, it was sort of a nominal where the contract says, um, you retain copyright, but exclusively licensed to the press, all of the rights associated with copyright, so that what you end up keeping is really what well, nothing. Um, and that uh, that's also been kind of a teaching moment. Um, like a cynical interpretation of that is that it's uh, something of a trick. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't know how valuable or useful it is to retain copyright nominally and exclusively licensed to the publisher all of the rights associated with copyright um, but that's another opportunity to have kind of that teaching conversation with the researcher um, just about the nature of those contracts as well i've been known to say that they they uh keep the wine and let you keep the bar they, they take the wine and let you keep the bottle or something like that um which is how i got a very friendly talking to when I was presenting in Abu Dhabi. And they said, we don't often like to use the alcohol metaphors in this part of the world. Can you find a different way to say that? Um, so be real, know your audience, but yeah, exactly right. Keep keep the wine on the bottle. Yes. Maria, anything to add to that? 
think now I think we should probably go to the next question. It's time okay. moves along. Great. And the next one is, I think, yours indeed. Um, so the question, open access scholarship will not be recognized for, for promotion and tenure. I'm going to kill my career if I do this OA stuff. How do you respond to those sort of questions? Um, you know, again, probably not a satisfying first response. How do you know uh, would be one. Do you actually, have you actually seen cases where it's clear that uh, participating in open culture, that sharing your work via open access has damaged the reputation of a scholar? Um, there are, as a, uh, in support, you could say that there are a couple of cases where it seems clear that it helped with the promotion and tenure case. But really, you see, I'm laughing at us as I listen to us. We're the same with that. Everything is an opportunity for education. Right. Every question, this is good pedagogy. Every question is an opportunity for education. Uh, because promotion and tenure cases to so, are so much about how you present them and the case that you make for yourself. And I was thinking about a couple of uh, uh, dossiers that I, or portfolios that I've reviewed for promotion and tenure. And I have to say, these have mostly come from faculty members who were librarians as well, but they have put together beautiful statements about the um, impact of their open publications and co constructed the evidence um, in ways that go beyond the citation count. It is something that you may want to talk about with your faculty member if they're in a discipline that values citation counts. Uh, that there is a pretty well documented citation advantage uh, to open access materials because more people can read them. Um, and so if more people read them, probably more people will cite them. Uh, but beyond that, there are other forms of impact. I remember one I read that presented a list of languages into which their article had been translated that you would never have expected. But somebody who could translate had found the article and was trying to recirculate it and make it available in their native language. Uh, or classroom adoption. Um, and I know this is true of myself as an instructor. I'm much more likely to bring something into the classroom if it if it's open, because I don't want my students to have to pay if, if they don't. And there's just an ease of getting there, right, usually. So I can give them a link and say, off you go. Um, so that there are different measurements of impact. And it's really about the case that you make for yourself uh, I'm also just not sure, and others maybe, how much the people who review your p and uh, dossier are looking to see if an article is open or not. If you make a um, principled statement of support for openness, then it may come into thinking in their assessment. But if they're really looking at your publication list, that may not be the question they're asking. So I would engage your your scholar in a question of their disciplinary culture around p &T. What are people looking for? Uh, what, how do you demonstrate the value of these materials? Uh, I'll pause there. What, if, what about you, Josh? Well, what do you think? I think, um, you know, to the, the be real um, thing that keeps coming back up, like, I would never presume to tell researchers in another discipline or even in another sub area of my own discipline where they should publish. Like you, they know their research and they know where they should publish. Um, so I would talk about um, open opportunities beyond open journals, um, so open archiving. Um, but I might also think about how, like I think there's a lot of belief in unwritten criteria um, and something that is, I've heard administrators and PT committees say in my own institution is that the criteria, the written criteria are the most important thing. And that's not to say that there aren't individual senior researchers hidden away in certain departments that could tank a uh, uh, someone's case. And that's something like, I would never want someone to take a risk on their career. Um, you know, because I in, like convinced them that it was a good idea. But I mean, I think I might like see if 
a conversation can be had with the department chair to understand departmental uh, temperament related to open um, open journals or um, see if like a I had a, a cover I recorded an interview this morning with the vice vice provost for faculty development who manages and oversees the entire PT process at the University of Kansas on the topic was um, why she supports open access as a researcher, not necessarily in her role as VP, but I think the fact that she sat for that interview to be recorded um, is evidence of her support as a VP. And so like sometimes, especially people who are new to an institution may not really have a complete picture of the attitudes at that institution towards these ideas. And um, some conversations could reveal that it's not as dire as uh, might be believed. Yeah, Josh, I, I'm totally with you on the, I would never tell somebody where to publish. Somebody who will sometimes tell faculty how to publish are the big funders. And so something I talk to faculty about sometimes is like if, clearly if everybody who gets NSF funds is publishing openly, it's not killing their careers. No department is gonna say, if you get money from the National Science Foundation, we're not gonna keep you in our department, right? There's there's a sufficient flow of money that there must be something that's that's right happening there. And indeed, we point to folks like Aaron McKiernan who have, have built a full career doing nothing but open stuff in different ways. Um, but I, I think the core point is you should find the best venue. Um, openness doesn't poison an otherwise great venue just as it doesn't save an otherwise bad venue. Um, but openness is part of the process. It's a part of the process that some major movers, including departments and funders, are steering us towards more and more. But exactly as you both said, our job is to help you understand the environment, make the right choices for your career, and then explain to the, to the decision makers on your campus why that was the right decision. And what, one other thing, I, and you set me up perfectly, Will, I was feeling negligent for mentioning. I've, I've only seen a couple times, but I've seen people calling out compliance with funder mandates, or in one case, with an institutional mandate uh, to share their work openly. Uh, we're never quite sure if those mandates are enforced, but they made a point of saying, in keeping with the uh, policy of the university, that materials be openly available, you will find in my section of the institutional repository, a complete record of my publication, et cetera. And it's a case that has to be made, but it's another uh, point that can be played up in, in favor of openness in a PNT file. Great point, absolutely. So I think the next question is mine and, and um, open access means anyone can use my work. And this is, this is an evergreen concern and it's sort of a cousin of the earlier myth that we talked about in terms of giving up copyright. But I want to acknowledge in a, in a be real sense that anxiety about your scholarly work being decontextualized and thrown up on blast on some weird social media site or whatever, or about it being just simply ripped off, that's a real concern. That's a real anxiety for scholars. And so um, it's it behooves us to respect that and recognize where that's coming from, even if we think the outcome is not as as dire as as they might imagine. Um, and I also would be remiss if I didn't recognize that the recent high profile use of scholarly Early works to train AI has thought, oh my God, what's going to happen to it? It could be used in these ways that feel really unethical for me. Um, this is a cousin to the other question I asked about copyright, though, because the reality, as discussed above, is that closed access simply empowers publishers to permit uses where it's convenient and lucrative for them in different ways, regardless of the author's actual preferences. That, in fact, has been the story of artificial intelligence, is big journals saying, because we are the rights holder for all this stuff, we're going to permit this use in training AI in different ways, and there isn't going to be an opt-out for the authors, and I have seen over and over and over in social media and other places, authors going, I can't believe they're doing this. And like, yeah, you signed your copyright away. They are legally permitted to do that in different ways. Um, so open access as a way to, to, you know, push back on some of those ideas, at least a little bit. Um, we don't know how AI training is going to end out being understood in terms of fair use or fair dealing and the idea expression distinction and some of those nerdy copyright things, but at least for the moment open access as accomplished by Creative Commons licenses returns at least some measure of control to scholars and so that actually helps hopefully reduce the concern that anybody can use my work. The more complete and sometimes harder to swallow answer though is that bad actors are going to bad act 
regardless of copyright law. That somebody who's ripping off your work is already violating both the legal and ethical norms, and they probably don't care whether you're the rights holder or not. That just doesn't matter to them. And similarly, if there's a flawed copy of your work that goes out that omits critical details or misconstrues your argument as happening, that's being done in bad faith, and that person doesn't care about the niceties of a Creative Commons license or not. Sharing your work out into the world means that other people can read and engage with it, and a closed regime um, only sort of it's certainly not better in some ways it makes it worse but but the reality is that if you, if you write something and put it out into the world you have to get comfortable at some level with other people talking back to it misunderstanding it and maybe even misconstruing it in different ways so that's the that's the we're friends and i'm going to give you the straight dope answer but i think that's that's the real answer there on top of the the nice happy no no cc actually empowers you in different ways but maria and josh how do you have those sometimes delicate conversations Go talk to Will. Good, good answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I have anything super to add, but just like the that recent news, um, I think it was Taylor and Francis, but I think a, a Wiley deal has also been announced. Um, resulted in several emails in my inbox and uh, also I think a letter that's been submitted to Inside Higher Ed, though I'm not sure of the status of that, um, of of Rutledge authors who uh, weren't comfortable. And so um, they kind of were like, what can I do? And the the answer that I could provide was like, with your existing work, not much, uh, re really not anything. I mean, you can make some noise, um, but for future work, um, you know, you at least have the opportunity to think about it before you sign the contracts. But in the end, whether or not they'll seek different publishers or, or that kind of thing I, uh, to be determined. And I, I don't want to sound caustic about it, but I, I like to engage people in a conversation that begins, people are using your work? <laughs> like, that's okay, huh? <laughs> but then, uh, you know, to say, okay, so when and why are we concerned that, that somebody may make use of our work? Normally we celebrate it. That's the reason we do it. So what is it that makes, and, and there are plenty of good reasons for people to be alarmed by that use, but I think it's a good conversation to have. Yeah, that's a good point. Like in, I have a um, things that have been used. Like if I think about the ways that my work has been used in a hundred percent of the cases that I'm aware of, I'm glad it was used that way. And that was possible because of open licensing. Um, so while we can imagine negative situations and surely there are factual ones that we can point to and say, this researcher unfortunately experienced this. Um, I think most of the cases are either neutral or positive, but I, you know, that's, um, speculative. Yeah. And, and where there's work to do, it is preparing people to protect the contextualization of their work or respond when some very political person tries to take work out of context and use it to, you know, get donations or whatever, for sure. And maybe this takes us to the, the last um, myth or conversation point or common question that we might get, which is sort of the reverse of some of the other ones that we've heard, but but maybe as as in need of unpacking in its own way as well. And Josh, do you wanna you wanna talk about the excited person who comes up to you in a couple of weeks at OA Week and goes, yeah, everything must be open all the time right now, do it. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I would be like, I would, I think, I would lean into that excitement and also try to temper it in a way that didn't like completely, you know, I don't want to necessarily throw a wet, wet blanket on, but I would look for ways to sort of um, think about introducing critiques of open access. Like I, 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 pre I usually present myself as su supportive of open access and also recognizing that there are critiques of open access, um, that open access isn't a panacea, you know, that um, there are particular ways that it's been implemented or uh, different ways that, you know, people experience it that are not advantageous. And so, um, you know, like sort of a glad to encounter your excitement, but try to add, introduce more nuance into their, their thinking. And so, you know, like reframing this as a, as, a, as a concern, if not a question, like I think you could imagine 
uh, like I'd like to make this open, but, and then whatever the limitation or concern may be, or I'm not sure if I'm comfortable making this open for whatever reason. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons that a researcher may not want to or be able to make something open access. Uh, in our book on starting on page 91, Tara Robertson has a, a really great short piece that's based on a blog post that she wrote, which is also available um, about how open sharing can do harm. Um, and so like maybe the topic is sensitive in a way that places the author at risk. Uh, maybe a community related to the research hasn't provided consent that included open licensing or even sharing of some kinds of data or information. And I'm thinking in particular of indigenous knowledge. Um, maybe it was funded by an industry or security related funder and the author's hands are tied. So like just again, like meeting authors where they are, um, deferring to their prerogative and trying to have a conversation with them about what the limitations of open sharing are as well. So like shame and coercion, I don't think have any place here. Um, I would grant the benefit of the doubt, assume a posture of grace, uh, of mutual goodwill, active listening and an effort to understand. Um, you know, if, if their concern is based on misunderstanding or incorrect assumptions, then we could uh, gently educate. Um, but if their concern is more nuanced, acknowledge it and defer to their prerogative. So like just meet them where they are. Um, that could result in an ally in the future. Um, or like, and I think there's something, there's value in trying to see it from, from their position with the same care that you would hope that they consider your arguments in favor of sharing, um, you know, as like, treat them like the colleague that they are. Um, so I would keep in mind that open is a spectrum. Um, that public access without open licenses is better than no access, that open license, an open license that the researcher is comfortable with is better than no open license as regards openness. Um, so don't make the enemy the perfect of the good, uh, especially don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, especially where perfect is like from your point of view and not necessarily theirs. Um, being dogmatic isn't gonna get, get, get us where we want to go. Um, they, I will mention this earlier, but they, they might be required to share depending on uh, funder or journal expectations. And if that's the case, I'd help them understand what the requirements are and how to comply. Um, and if that's not the case, I would engage with them uh, as a, a mutual learning opportunity, um, prioritize respect for where they're coming from uh, and reflect on what you learn from that conversation because it might have implications for how you uh, talk about open access moving forward. Yeah, that's a great response, Josh, and um, I really appreciate you bringing the, the example from Tara in particular, because I think that's a really, a really powerful and important one. The sort of buzzy uh, buzzword or, or catchphrase you'll hear sometimes is as open as possible, as closed as necessary, and that really speaks to the spectrum that you described really well. I also, <laughs> I keep banging the OA week drum, but but the theme has has often been some variant of open for what purpose? Open, by, that open isn't a positive good in and of itself absent anything else. Open is a tool that we use to get to inclusion or bibliodiversity or more impact or, or whatever it is. So so starting from a place of like, I'm not championing open just to do open. Open should be used where it is valuable and rejected where it's not valuable in different ways as well. Maria, do you want to put a, put a capper on this question? No, I think you've, I think you've capped it very nicely. <laughs> well, wonderful. So I think those were the, the common questions that we heard and that Amy was really kind and smart enough to share with us. We promised a few minutes for your questions as well. So this is this is some time for that. As in the past, um, if at the top of the hour you have to run off, you won't hurt our feelings. I think we're able to be here for a, a little bit beyond that if, if you want to have some deeper discussions. Um, I'm going to stop share now because I'm really excited to see what has been happening in the chat. I bet it's been really exciting and awesome. Um, if you all are comfortable sharing questions, either in chat or otherwise, that's awesome. And while you're putting those together, uh, Josh or Maria or Nick, if there were any comments or questions, either comments on other questions or new questions that you wanted to elevate now, that might be a fun way in too. Uh, oh, since somebody hopped in immediately on the Q&A when it opened with the, with the question, and it might be make sure that we get a chance to address that a little bit. Uh, the anonymous person was asking, may I please have some help on reaching different professors to post their open access articles to repositories? 
we have tried emails reaching out to different professors at, at, by different meetings. This hasn't really reached widely as, as widely as we have hoped. May it please have help. Um, and I was thinking about strategies uh, and I think going to those meetings and talking in person can, can be helpful um, as well as email. If you can get yourself into a faculty meeting or some sort of department departmental, excuse me, event, um, so I think uh, faculty scholars, I can say I am one, like keeping up with the Joneses, uh, pointing out that peers, either at their institution or at other institutions, particularly if they're high prestige institutions, are engaging in this as a practice can be helpful. Um, more expensive, but it worked well when I was first at Michigan and we opened our repository. Um, our boss at the time, uh, Dean Paul Courant, said, you know what faculty need? They need, I think the metaphor he used was a concierge, someone who will welcome you in and help walk you through. Um, and he provided some funding for uh, MSLIS students from the school there uh, to work with our repository coordinator to take uh, faculty who were interested to take their CV and to review it and to say, oh, these are easy as can be to get to the repository. Got a copy? We can do it. Uh, these, we might have to figure some things out. Uh, but that started a practice for them rather than them having to figure it out from scratch. It took a little money. You may not have access to that. Uh, but that that can be one way is just help it, helping them get started. But what about you two? You're on the ground with this work more these, these days than I am. Yeah, I mean, I've we've done the same uh, of sort of like looking at publication lists and saying there are opportunities here. Uh, you know, these are easy. These are require little work. These are hard and kind of um, starting with the easy ones. And maybe that's as far as we get. But if it starts to build a practice of open sharing and repository, um, you know, that's that's a step in the right direction. I'll say something that's worked well for us in the past is meeting faculty at point of need. So back in 2012 and 13, when the NI, the, the, a new set of requirements, I think from the NIH in particular, um, were coming down the pike for faculty members, our pitch wasn't, we're going to help you do OA. Our pitch was, funders are about to ask you to do some things that you might not know how to do. We're going to help you solve that problem. We're not asking something, we're not asking you to do us a favor, we're, we're gonna clear some road for you to do the stuff you already want to do. And so meeting people where they are in the moment is always valuable. And in particular, when that external pressure comes from funders to do, you know, you, I need to do data sharing. What's a data sharing? I don't know what an RDM is. Well, the libraries are, libraries are here to help you figure out data sharing practices and what a research data management plan is. Um, we're so happy to help you. Oh, and incidentally, we're moving a lot of things into the open in that space as well. So, so finding those opportunities, whether they're about funders or new trends or whatever it is to say, um, we understand where you're coming from faculty. We're gonna make your life easier and your work more productive is often a, a better way to start than there's this cool thing called open that we're gonna suggest that you do. And that might be a nice entree. The other question I saw in the Q&A section was about the Nelson memo and, and what we think that sort of what impact that is going to have. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, Maria and Josh, what you think, and, and Nick, if you have any thoughts, you're welcome to jump in as well. But what, what do you all think? Um, yeah. What, yeah. What, yeah. Uh, uh, impact open scholarship is how they framed it specifically. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to result in more open scholarship. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not a, a really like technical or smart answer um but i think that there's nick you can confirm closer to 35 or so um funders that are impacted by the the nelson memo that's an expansion that's not 35 new ones that's up to 35 from the previous about 16 that were had policies i think from the holdren memo um issued in 2013 effective in 2015 i think um, and so that's going to be uh, an expansion in the number, uh, the volume. Well, it's not, I don't think, an expansion in the number of funded research, but it's an open requirement, a public requirement for a greater volume of that open research or of that funded research. Um, 
that's we I expect that that's going to be in place on the plan, plan, uh, planned upon timeline. Um, but there's a lot of sort of like, you know, push and pull, like we saw the um, American Chemical Society created something called the article development charge uh, about a year, about this time last year, I think. Um, and so uh, I can't, you know, none of us can see into the future uh, how various, I mean, but I, you know, I think some publishers are going to react one way and some publishers are going to react another and some scholars, well, scholar, funded scholars are going to by and large, I think, do what they're required to do in order to not lose their funding. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I know Spark is really studying that closely and kind of coordinating responses uh, and positioning itself as a resource for us, which is going to be super helpful uh, over the next couple or few years and beyond. Yeah, happy to, to jump in briefly on the question. And, and in terms of the agencies covered, uh, the the 2022 memo removes the threshold for, you know, which agencies are covered. Um, and, you know, sort of the exact numbers also, you know, can be challenging to pin down just given the, you know, sort of like Matryoshka doll nature of different, uh, you know, different funders and subfunders within the, the federal government, which has been, you know, something that we've been trying to pin down Uh uh, though actually our uh, uh, own Sparks own Katie Steen James is here on uh, the call and is the most expert person on our team uh, to answer that. So I will uh, just sort of let let Katie hop on. You know, if there's anything that that Katie wants to add, I'll just say you know a couple a couple things really briefly. One, uh, I think uh, Will, what you were saying earlier about like the original NIH policy and sort of that as an entree into having conversations with faculty. Yeah, you know, is such an important point around this, and like yeah, you know, just the opportunity to use the 2022 OSDP memo as you know, sort of a, a a calling card to start conversations with faculty, um, and exactly the way that you spoke to, I think you know, is a really strategic way to frame conversations, sort of come at conversations with with faculty, um, you know, particularly around things like Open Access Week, and then in terms of like the actual substance of Judith's question. Uh, you know, how the the memo will impact open scholarship. Uh, you know, I think right now we're really focused on the implementation phase of the memo. Um, and that will really be telling, um, you know, as to what the ultimate impact um, will be. So we're really trying to, you know, be active and engaging with agencies um, directly through things like RFIs, um, you know, to try to make sure that, you know, sort of the commitment to equity that was in the original text of the memo, you know, falls through an implementation, uh, you know, and harping on things like no cost options for compliance, uh, you know, to, to make sure that the, the implementation of the memo, uh, you know, sort of advances not just openness, but equity. Uh, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities for libraries um, to play a really important role in that, you know, by edging, uh, excuse me, educating faculty about, you know, sort of their options for complying with uh, the memo, uh, you know, so that they don't just immediately, uh, you know, run to the kinds of things that might be advertised to them uh, by different publishing venues. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and uh, invite Katie as our expert on all things uh, OSDP memo to, to jump in and you know, correct anything I might have uh, said wrong or, or add to, uh, to this, this point. Yeah, thanks, Nick. No corrections at all. And thanks always to Will, Maria, uh, and Josh. I mean, Will, I think you spoke about it um, really well. I like to think of it as kind of the rubber meeting the road, I think in a new way that it hasn't before. And there's new opportunities now for research offices and libraries to talk uh, in ways they maybe hadn't before. New questions about, I mean, in libraries, everyone has known that we've been spending, um, you know, money on subscriptions for a long time, but now thinking about how do I comply with a funder policy, make my research open access, there's a um, you know, I can pay an APC, but I also um, can deposit the author's accepted manuscript. So I think that piece um, is going to be really interesting as folks get ready to respond um, to the policies coming down from the agencies. I did just want to add, um, yes, yeah, so I saw that Sherry put in um, a couple of helpful resources there where we are tracking all of the RFIs related to the Nelson memo that have come out. 
you'll see that there's um, ones related to the plans. And then the only agency we've seen so far come out with their draft policies, the NIH, which is also indicated there. In terms of the, uh, the whole kind of uh, nature of agencies that will be covered. I'm still waiting to confirm it exactly from OSCP. Spark has sent a letter to OSCP asking for an official list, but I believe um, through some work that Senator Wyden's office has been doing, it's going to be more like 27. That's inclu inclusive of uh, the sub-agencies and the agencies. So like um, Depart uh, HHS, for example, um, is going to include NIH and other agencies under it, um, but we think it's going to be around 27. Don't quote me on that yet, but just wanted to give that a very kind of real-time uh, information that I just received. And then we at Spark will, of course, I'll be working with Nick to make sure we are analyzing those agency policies when they come out into a public-facing resource where you can look across all of them find the common denominators and see all the features um, that you're interested in. And then I think from that, you know, with our Helios open work that we're doing with um, campus administrators, we can develop additional resources that are gonna be of interest to those folks as well. So I think that's all that I have to add. Katie, Lisa had a question in the chat about anything on the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So like, you know, that's that's our funder. Uh, so have, have you heard anything from IMLS? Yeah, so I have heard things from them. They um, have been going on a listening tour. Some of you may have participated in some of those where they haven't, um, as far as I know, put out their actual plan publicly, but they have explained some of the contours of it in a listening session format. I think some of those are available maybe publicly, like a recording of those. So that's kind of what they've been doing in partnership with NEH. They typically will do it together. Um, but I haven't seen their actual like proposed plan or proposed policy, just a presentation on the things that it's going to include. So I will, um, that's a good reminder. If I can find um, a public version of that, I'll try and make sure we have it on our website too. I, I have often, in comparison to other fields, appreciated how relatively easy it is to practice openly in librarianship. Uh, like we, we have a, a lot, I mean, the, our book um, is has kind of been a you know a launch pad or you know foundation for this series, and um, I'm not sure if we've told the story before, but when we re when we had our our first call with Erin Nevius, the the editor at ACRL, um, she we sort of pitched the idea, and she was like, uh, "This is pretty you know you guys have a, a rich idea here, and you've already done so much thinking about it, and so you know." here's how it would move forward, uh, you know, give me a proposal. And uh, I, I was like, hold up. It's really important to us. Like, at, it's a, a non-negotiable that the work be open with open licenses and creators retain copyright and so on. And she went, okay. Uh, it was like, not controversial at all. And I thought that we were going to have to really like make a case and go to bat for it. Um, and, you know, Diamond Open Access Journals, at least in scholarly communication and adjacent areas, um, J the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication is no fee to authors or readers. Uh, the Journal for Copyright and Education and Librarianship, no fee to authors or, or readers. There, We have options. Uh, and so like, I, I don't anticipate it having much of an impact on me as a researcher being beholden to funder requirements, um, more the, you know, the outreach to or other funded researchers. Yeah, really, same boat for sure. And I appreciate the great, the expertise we were able to tap into here. I wanted to briefly also gesture towards the thing that, that I get up in the morning excited for, which is I think the Nelson memo is also doing the, the good continuing work of broadening what we mean when we talk about openness that they're there you know going back to 2013 there was a like remove paywalls so the public can read this stuff and a move towards talking about broader impacts and open and public science and that other stuff that that's the part of it that like i, I love getting rid of paywalls for sure but i also really love demonstrating the value of our work in you know to make the world a better place and more inclusive and that kind of stuff so to the extent that those parts of the conversation are more foregrounded that's that's another piece I wanted to call out as being really, really one that's exciting to me and that I hope will move forward. Will, I, I think the, the question you are about to turn your attention to in the, uh, the Q&A is one that you're particularly well suited to. 
um, the way I was thinking about that is that typically tech transfer is interested in the sort of trademark and patent sorts of uh, of things and not the publication side of things. And that like I think our IP policy specifically says that for publications like books and journals and so on, um, those belong to the author as a matter of policy, if not of like law, that they are not work for hire. Um, and so that hasn't been an issue at my institution. And usually the contracts for those works say that trademarks and or patent rights aren't transferred with the rights for the publication. And so I think uh, there's an interesting conversation to be had about the alignment or lack thereof between open advocacy and services and support and tech transfer. Um, but that's the sort of neoliberal academy that we have been backed into over the course of the last several decades. So, you know, my colleagues in that office at KU are my colleagues. And if they had a question related to any of this stuff, I would be happy to talk to them uh, and see where we can find common ground, but it's never come up and I'm not aware of any antagonistic uh, sort of relationship there or feeling or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great answer. And I totally agree on the lack of, of an, an antagonistic relationship. I've seen a couple of weird moments where one's foot sort of trips over the other that I'll, I'll point to just for some some context. Um, the first and probably the most obvious has to do with computer code, which is both copyrightable and patentable in different ways. And there is often a dollar signs in people's eyes in a different way. Um, so our tech transfer office has put some some pretty hard limits on what sort of open license can be put on software and code that's released at the university in different ways um, for some reasons that are legitimate and some reasons that maybe are about a misunderstanding of open licenses. But but when you get into the stuff that, that looks a little weird, that's often the case. We've also had a couple of folks who um, the university gets a grant and so the university asserts some ownership in works created with those grant funds that technically go to the institution rather than the, indi than the individual. Um, and we had one scholar in particular who was writing a like a booky book scholarly book, but it somehow got into the tech transfer pipeline and it was like months and months of going back and forth to explain this isn't a multi million dollar idea, this is a very small monograph so so helping put those things in the right bucket can be really valuable. And then the last thing I'll share is, is a, a moment of frustration in my past. Um, a few years back, there was a, a call for, um, I think it was a, a request for comment about the value of open licenses in funded stuff. And I was excited for my institution, NC State, to write a comment that basically said, open is awesome and it's the future, we're a public land grant. But when I looked, NC State had already submitted a comment. And the comment that was submitted was open is bad and we're suspicious of it. Hmm. And tech transfer had picked it up by the wrong handle, essentially, and said, oh, we don't like this. We're going to speak on behalf of the university saying this thing. And I was going to speak on behalf of the university to say something really different. Um, so from that, I have developed a much closer, uh, regular communication sort of relationship with my tech transfer people to make sure we understand each other a little bit better. But the the baseline framing of what does this stuff mean can feel different based on where you sit. And so that just goes, Josh, to your your point about really being colleagues and really communicating well so that there isn't that that confusion or or misalignment in some ways. But Maria, you're in a totally different space. How how has this come up in your work? I don't think you so much about this uh tech transfer, I got thinking about a comment that Lisa made in the chat in response to Josh rightly expressing our ability to work in the open space as people who work in library and information science. And she pointed out that, yeah, maybe not so much across, across LIS as a discipline or like that maybe archivists, maybe tech services people have different conditions, uh, constraints, cultures. She didn't use those words. Uh, but it put, put me in mind of something I always like to say in these conversations or to have the conversation is something like, tell me about the perceptions or the attitudes in your discipline. You know, uh, because disciplinary cultures are very different. Um, when I teach my scholarly communication class, I make each student pick a discipline and go out and interview a scholar and ask them questions about things. But and always say, ask them what they think about open access. Yeah, or what does their discipline think about it? Is it used? Or the, do they know if there's a disciplinary repository? And it's always great. The students come back and I say, so what'd you learn? 
and you know there's somebody who's done physics and there's a, somebody who's done poetry and somebody who's done classicists and it's all over the place and so we should probably be sensitive to that within our own field as well mm. yeah. yeah for sure i can appreciate that mm. So I think those were the questions that were in the Q&A. Um, I've been toggling through chat, but it, were there any questions that Josh, Maria, Nick, Katie, you wanted to you wanted to highlight? Or if you're in the audience and you want to make sure we get to your question, feel free to to post or repost it, and we're happy to discuss. It, there was a follow up about getting encouraging your scholars to participate. Act just saying, what 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 do you do when they don't email back? Um, and uh, I don't bash my head against that wall. I, I like I'll talk to people who want to talk to me uh, or who are willing to talk to me, but I'm not going to go. I'm not going to be the annoying party that's in my inbox following up multiple times to see if did you see my email from last week and the one from the week before, you know, like um, I have plenty to do without chasing down conversations that the other party doesn't want to have. So I'll let it go. I think Maria's point earlier about finding different ways in going to a faculty meeting or going to a, you know, it may be that this this route doesn't get you where you want to go, but this other one instead. So there, there's sometimes a way to, to not bash your head against a wall where it's really clearly a wall, but not just sort of walk away defeated hat in hand, you know, and say, no, there, there's another way to start this conversation, whether it's about funder it, mandates or whatever it is. Yeah, Maria. It'd be hard to get there, but I'm a big fan of the can I take you out for a cup of coffee? I'd like to learn more about your work. Start there. Um, and then maybe that's an entree. But uh, but it helps to get into the faculty meeting or something first so that you get a question from that person. You say, oh, that's complicated. Maybe we could grab a cup of coffee afterwards uh, using that kind of personal connection. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people asking questions, is there critical engagement like they're trying to wrap their head around it and understand it and like especially for scholars their way of doing that can be to try to like take an idea apart and look at look at the pieces of it and to try to like understand it and so like that is possibly evidence that you can get them there um or at least have a real conversation with them and you know maybe maybe make a friend uh or like a point of contact that um that leads to some other engagement in the future um I also think I wouldn't necessarily read failure to respond to emails as hostile. Um, you know, like people are busy. Uh, like, it, you know, editors are having a hard time getting reviewers. Uh, like it's hard filling service, you know, committee requirements and getting external reviewers right now. And like, so, so on and so forth. Like, uh, I think, you know, benefit of the doubt. They have a lot on their plates uh, and, you might not be their priority right now, but maybe someday you will be. And so, yeah, I mean, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily try to climb that hill, uh, but um, I wouldn't necessarily read it as they hate me either. The hardest lesson to learn is mostly people are not thinking about you. They're not sitting around being mad at you or disappointed in you or embarrassed for you. They just aren't thinking about you at all, for sure. Well, really, really good questions and comments. Nick, I see you coming in. Please jump in. Yeah, I just thinking that there are probably folks on this call that are thinking about Open Access Week. Uh, yeah, and the end of next month, um, you know, perhaps, you know, trying to think what might make sense in terms of, you know, participating in some capacity. Um, I'm curious if, you know, sort of the three of you have suggestions for folks, you know, particularly, you know, like lighter weight ways that folks might, you know, engage with Open Access Week, um, you know, sort of given the timeline from here to, to then, um, you know, I imagine there are probably also folks on the call that might have suggestions uh, on that front. Two, and before I sort of turn it over to y'all to actually answer the question with experience, I'll also say, you know, that at Spark, we've been, uh, you know, charting like, you know, how folks use Open Access Week and sort of what is and isn't helpful. And for example, we've tried to sort of de-emphasize, um, you know, to some extent, like, you know, sort of 
just talking about events, recognizing there are lots of other ways that you can engage with Open Access Week, and there can be, you know, sort of uh, an inertia to continue hosting events because there have been, and if they work on campus, that's you know fantastic, and folks should keep doing them. Um, you know, but I know there are campuses where they haven't been the most effective thing. Um, you know, want to create space for folks to sort of experiment and do different things. Um, you know, based on what's most useful uh, locally. Um, so, you know, would love to hear, you know, sort of any thoughts or suggestions that you all have, you know, especially in the context of the short timeline before the end of October. Um, you know, and again, if there are folks that are, um, here would love to, to hear any contributions from the chat too. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean, like as someone who had, I think I've been engaged in open access week, uh, event or you know planning it's 2024 is this my 11th year 10th year something like that We're getting um, so. yeah and uh like every about you know june when i start thinking like okay fall isn't too far away i should start thinking about like what do i do in the fall open access weekend is, is in the fall part of me has this like uh gotta come up with something new you know like um and i had a thing this year um a speaker who had an, a relationship with the institution and can really readily speak convincingly from a humanist perspective about the value of openness um, and they had some things go on um that uh had to cancel their visit like in august which is normally like i would not go into August, planning to do something for Open Access Week and not knowing what that thing is. Um, and so I totally support that. They made the right choice for them and we're hoping that we can do it at some point in the future. But the sort of what can we do on relatively short notice that might be valuable, um, what we came up with was like what we're calling open access success stories. And uh, that's what that conversation with the VP for faculty development was this morning. She, um, her name is Amy Mendenhall. She comes from our school of social welfare and social workers really understand that practitioners need access to the scholarship in order to do, to help human beings the best that they can. And so um, Amy and I have had previous interactions around openness. And so when I started making a list of people to reach out to, to say like, can we record a short conversation, like a 10 to 15 minute interview that we're gonna cut down to 90 to 120 seconds of just like the, the best little bits, um, casual conversation, like tell me how open access has benefited you. Well, how does it benefit in your field and like, you know, things like how have you engaged these kinds of things? I, I contacted six people off of an initial brainstorming list of about um, 15 to 20 and all six said, sure, I'd love to do that. And so we recorded the first one this morning. It took less than 30 minutes for us to walk over there, set the stuff up, do have the conversation and come back. You know, I, I benefit from having an office of communication and advancement with uh, recording equipment and skills. She was mic'd. There was a ring light, you know, like, I don't know how to do those things. So like, you wouldn't have to do that in a recorded context. You could, you know, say like, we want to circulate quotes from respected researchers here that have had some positive experience with open access as a way to sort of say, hey, your colleagues, we're not, it's not us saying you should value this, but like your peers, your fellow professors and PIs and so on. Um, here's what they're saying about, about open access. Uh, we'll see how impactful that is, but the lift is relatively light and it gives us content to use in future social media and uh, press releases and things like that. And we're going to conclude them with like, a, do you have an open access success story? Get in touch. Do you want to know about um, open access news and events? Like join this list, you know, so like if it broadens our network, uh, I'll call that a win. Uh, so, you know, that's a non-event based example that I am currently working on and hopeful for whether or not my hope pans out, you know, to be determined. But um, that's the plan. This is spitballing because it didn't occur to me until our session, our questions were coming to an end. I thought, well, this is pretty good. This is successful. People have questions and we've been able to engage around them. I thought, oh, I wonder if there could be 
a fairly low barrier entry thing one could do with faculty along the same vein on campus which might start out with a web form or even like paper sticky notes or something. Got a question about open access? You know, help, help us to understand what you need to know. Maybe you could have a prize for the best question or a drawing or something like that. Um, and then once those were assembled, you could do a FAQ for your campus. If there were, seemed like there was interest, do some kind of webinar or a coffee session or something that said, let's talk about your questions. Uh, so that might be one, one way of approaching it. And I saw Colleen and Julia shared some examples in the chat as well that I think are really, really good. Um, I'll, being a lawyer, I'll be Debbie Downer and offer some pitfalls that I've seen people <laughs> fall into in the past. Um, I, I think the first, the first pitfall that I've seen a lot of people fall into is to say, this is an open access week event. This has to be about nothing but open access. This has to be about, there's going to be a big orange lock and I'm going to give you cookies and we're going to talk about that. Um, Josh, last year you did an OA event around um, Sarah Lambden and privacy. Was that? Was that uh, it wasn't OA week. Like we do, but we did have Sarah to KU. Sarah's a two-time KU graduate um, and loves the University of Kansas. Uh, and so I think when I realized that, I was like, "Ooh, I, can, I bet I can get her here." Uh, and we had a really successful event. I think it was like standing room. Uh, I, I have a, my office has a budget, so I bought a bunch of copies of the book, and there was a line of people after she spoke that had their book and were getting their book signed. Um, but that wasn't during open access week. But had I not done it in May, I probably would have been like, Sarah, can we get you here for open access week? Um, so yeah, like, and that's talking about privacy and uh, like surveillance issues yeah. in scholarly publishing. Absolutely. So, but so yeah, yeah, I mean, some people focus on open education uh, or, you know, like whatever you can use to, I think, any of the sort of like pieces of scholarly communication, you can wrap back to open access uh, in a pretty natural way. So like you can get some messaging in there. Um, and yeah, I mean, Julia, I feel you. Like I, I see little point in pouring a ton of time and effort into an event that a handful of the same people who came last year uh, show up to. And so I'm always trying to avoid that. And luckily my leadership has sort of agreed, like they don't want me doing that either. Um, but if, so it's always like a, you know, with the speaker that I had planned, I was like, I think this one is worthwhile. Like, I think this one will work. But the test for that would would actually be how many people show up. Uh, and I don't get to find that out until we find get circle back and, and have them come. Yeah, yeah. so, so be, going back to our earlier slide, be real, right? Do, do something that's really genuinely interesting for people that is related. Don't just do an open access event. And the other thing that we do a bad job of is we keep reinventing the wheel, even though we're a movement about not reinventing the wheel. Like the OA Week page has a bunch of amazing event, national events that you can stream in or borrow this cool poster that's openly licensed. Or like, there are a bunch of smart people who've been doing this for a long time. Um, please pick up what they're doing and use the parts that are best for you rather than saying that would be cheating. I have to do my own thing with my own cookies or whatever. So, so build on the strength of the community and that's what's I think gonna make it most successful. Yeah. So I know we're coming up to the to 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central, and I, I the numbers are starting to dwindle a little bit. I, I'm happy to maybe do one or two more questions if they are there, but if not, I just wanna say thank you um, to, to thank Nick you. and to Spark. Thank you for stayed with us. It's, yeah. This is still a lot, a lot of people for the last half hour of webinar. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And thank yeah, thank you all for being here. This is really, you know, it's it's an event that that we went into going, what does this look like exactly? And it's been it's been far beyond my expectation. It's been really, really wonderful. And the the participation, the questions, the commentary and sharing resources in chat has made it so 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 huge gratitude to everybody for what's been really, really a wonderful thing. Yeah, thank you. All that. <laughs> Then we'll have to come back off mute to uh, just give you all uh, another big round of thanks for being the the driving force uh, behind this series and your willingness to uh, you sort of make the time to to put this together and uh, uh, you know run these these sessions. Uh, so really, really appreciate uh, all that that work, uh, Maria, Josh, and Will. And looking forward to getting folks feedback and you know taking that on board for you know where we might be able to take these kinds of sessions 
uh, in the future.